You are listening to Speak Now, jamming with my jazz right here at 95.7 FM WELT. Again, I'm here every Friday from 4 to 6 p.m. doing two things I enjoy doing, talking with you and jamming with my jazz. So today, um, we're going to continue with sharing the journeys of local authors. And so today, let me just introduce you to Kathleen Turner. Hello, Kathleen. Hi, it's nice to be here with you, Jenna. Thank you for coming in. And um, so Kathleen is a novelist and devotional writer. Um, Her most recent work is the novel Things Not Seen. She's currently working on a sequel. I want to start off with who's Kathleen? Who is Kathleen? Ah, oh, she is a a uh, a woman who grew up just twenty miles away from Fort Wayne in Columbia City, and ended up in New York for a while after she got married and went to school in the South. Uh, mother of two daughters, grown daughters, and uh, so we live here in Fort Wayne, my husband and I. And uh, th- that's a quick overview, right? Yeah, that's a quick <laughs> overview. That's okay. It's so cool when um, guests come into the studio. Um, and as I'm preparing, we're just kind of talking, having small talk. But I always wish I I have the mic on before I have the mic on. Um, I shared that I've struggled this week and um, this time here is my time to, to play. And you shared something so interesting um, with me that I said, can you share that now? Well, <laughs> we were talking about being in control. And of course, we all want to be in control of situations in our life and, and other things. And I said, well, I like to, usually people want to control either people or circumstances. And I said, I would like to control people, and my husband would like to control circumstances. So between the two of us, we figure we could rule the world. And (laughs) fortunately for everybody else, that is not the way it is. (laughs) But I love, that made me laugh, and and I thought, that's good. Let's get into this book, is this book that you've written. Let's start off with your genre. What genre um, do you write? Well, this has got, this is a little bit of a mystery. Uh, We have uh, a mother who is a widow, and she has a teenage daughter in her senior year of high school, and she discovers that something's going on with her daughter. She's doing some behavior that's concerning to her, and it's a mystery to find out what's going on, and the more she finds out, the more concerned she becomes. And it's also her faith journey, like what's going on, and there's so much uncertainty, and can I trust God during all this time. Okay. Okay. So it's it's more of a novel. It's a novel then. It's it's yes. a novel with a little bit of mystery and faith. Okay. It's a little bit of mixture. I, I love the journey of authors because you can pretty much identify your genre yourself. Do you write anything else besides mysteries, novels? Uh, previously I have, and I, I still dabble once in a while in this, uh, devotional writing. Your devotional writing? Yes. Okay. And I okay. have, um, I've been a contributing author to three anthologies of devotions. Uh, beginning in 1993, three, uh, 365 Meditations for Mothers of Young Children. And then in 97, 365 Meditations for Women. And then again, 365 Meditations for Mothers by Mothers in 2007. And I will tell you the funny story about how this all started. This was actually, we were living in New York at the time, Queens. And we went to a small church and we had a church newsletter. And I asked if I could write a little devotional on the back page. And I called it Far Above Rubies because there's a verse in Proverbs about a woman of character, her value is far above rubies. So that's where the title of the devotionals came from. And they were basically geared toward women, except the men were reading them too. Everyone seemed to enjoy them. And I was a little bit discouraged at that time about my writing and where it was going, if it was going any place. And my husband said to me, well, how about if I just take some of these, collect a few of them, and ghost write a letter for you? and pick out some publishers that maybe might be interested. And I said, well, if you want to, go ahead. But I was pretty cynical about it at the time. And so he did that, and I signed the letter that he ghost wrote. And a few weeks later, Abingdon Press wrote back, and they were starting a to create an anthology of devotionals for women. They wanted 12 authors to write 
a month of devotionals, and they invited me to be one of them. So wow. to my husband's credit, the first publisher, and it came back as an acceptance. That's so, amazing. So that was pretty amazing. <laughs> I was pretty shocked at that. So that was encouraging. So that was the first one. And then through succeeding years, uh, I think... Um, I was invited again, and then I contacted them for the last one, and they were doing another one. So I was involved in three 365 books. So is that when you started writing? When did you start this writing journey? Oh, I I would go back to this um, story that I wrote in my probably about sixth or seventh grade spelling book. There were just three pictures on that page with about maybe 10 or 12 lines on the bottom of the page and we were supposed to write a story about one of the pairs of shoes one of the three pictures and they were all pictures of shoes and I picked one of the shoes and I started writing and I quickly ran out of space and so I added some more paper (laughs) and pretty soon it was more and more pages and I don't know where the story was going I never finished it but the teacher was so impressed he had me stand up and read the story to the class The only problem was, toward the end, I couldn't read my own handwriting, (laughs) so it just kind of petered out. But that's one of the first things I remember really sinking my teeth into and having fun with. And then there were succeeding things in high school. There was a, uh, every year there was a creative writing competition Mm -hmm. for essays, poetry, and short stories, and every year... I entered that and placed with some writing. And then my senior year, I won the overall award for the the top entry for that year. And then also in high school, I, I was very interested in writing by then. And I was in my typing class. And the typing teacher asked me to justify some copy that was going to be in the school newspaper. Now, you don't know even what justify is anymore. People don't know because we have computers that do justification. Right. Yes, Uh but that was typing and putting slashes at the end of the line to figure out spaces to make everything um, on the right, even on the right side and on the left. Nice and neat. Yes. Yes, And Mm -hmm. so she had me do some of that. Well, I didn't know, but she had just kind of picked me out and she started encouraging me And she encouraged me to take the journalism class the following year. And then I ended up on the school newspaper staff. And then I ended up as the assistant editor my senior year. And then I ended up winning the journalism award that year. And as I prepared for the show, I began to think about her and the different people in my life that were so involved in me continuing and being encouraged in my writing. And she was one of the early ones. And my husband was as well. And just different people along the way that saw something in me, the talent in me, and wanted to fan that flame and and to encourage me. And so much of what I have done in writing has been because other people saw and encouraged me. That's cool. Yes, yes. And so this has been in your, this is just in you. This isn't something that... Five years ago, I decided I want to write. This is in no. This, this is, in is you, a part this, of you. This is part of who I am. It's a giftedness. That's cool. Uh-huh. Yes. 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 Well, let me ask this: What makes you? Well, let's start back with your book. Okay. Is it um, traditionally published, or did you self-publish? It was it? self-published. And how? Did, why did you choose that over traditional publishing? I think it's it's a real different world of publishing now from from my perspective mm-hmm. and there because of of computers and the publishing houses they need to be able to know that they're going to sell the book it, they have a huge investment in a book and they tend to want people who are well known because it helps them guarantee that they're going to be able to sell the book. And I understand that. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, I think I'm just going to self-publish. I'm just going to take a stab at this and and do that. And so we, again, my husband helped me find Westbo Press, and they were just very responsive. And they saw the the angle of the book, the the Christian themes in the book, and... um, it went under Westbow Press, which is a self-publishing arm of Thomas, the Thomas Nelson. Okay. okay. Yes. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm glad to have that on there too. When you, what makes you stand out? Um, stand out as a writer. 
I think th- that I like to do kind of tough issues, mm-hmm. kind of a, a little bit off off the beaten path. That everything isn't tied up in a bow in in the novel, mm-hmm. and my character deals with questions, and she's pretty honest and. I think it reflects some of my own personal journey that I think sometimes God is very hard to find out and I and and to discover and how to live the Christian life is very challenging. And sometimes you can be afraid to ask the tough questions because it sounds like you don't have any faith or you don't understand or and it's like I like that about Marty, my character, that she'll ask those kind of questions and, and say the things that maybe aren't so politically correct in the oh, church, like as it that. were. I so, know. Yeah. It sounds like Marty is um, very comfortable being herself. She's comfortable being, uh, well, struggling. She struggles. Okay. And she gets more and more honest as, as the book goes on and as the struggle goes on because it's just exposing what she doesn't understand and is trying to find out about God and how to live your life and how to put the pieces together, how to put the truth together so that it makes sense. Okay. I don't think we talked about, let's just go right into that. What's the title of the book? Things Not Seen. Things Not Seen. And do you want to read an excerpt from it? I can read an excerpt. Yes. Warren left her alone the rest of the day, except for a few cryptic emails that sounded like snappy work orders. She steeled herself to read them for content only. She had enough to think about without trying to make sure Warren hadn't gotten his ego bruised. She lunched at her desk on a tuna sandwich and a luke- and lukewarm tea, declining Sandra's offer to get out of the office. She even pulled out a battered Bible from her desk. It used to be on her desk all the time. After David died, it went into the drawer. It wasn't that she didn't read the Bible anymore. It was just that sometimes the words and sto- stories were dark and sad, full of anguish. There were days that felt good. She wasn't alone. Other people had been where she was too. Yet at other times, she couldn't bear the thought of sadness, of endless sorrow cascading through the centuries, like a angry river destroying life and love. And there were to be more heart, heartaches until God kept his promise to end all sadness. To Marty, that seemed like many long, lonely years away. Very nice. As you were writing that, um, did it just flow from you, or did you get writer's block? Sometimes things flow, and sometimes there's block. There's like, I can't get it out. The, you know, the words, it's all in there, but yeah. it's like, how do I say it? And how did you say it then? Well, it, it, like this week, I was uh, working and writing, and I, I knew where, kind of where I wanted to start. I knew where I wanted to go, but it was like it took me... an hour 45 minutes to write about 100 words and I thought now come on now this isn't that hard but I struggled (laughs) and started working and changing things around and then as I did as I just keep working it becomes easier and sometimes I just have to say just start in and it could be really tacky and not hang together but you've got to start and then you can go back and edit right so I think when we did our initial um, conversation, you also shared with me that um, you started writing more after you retired. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes, I have. Uh, before, it was if I worked 40 hours a week uh-huh. and came home and then started my other job as, you know. Mother, chief, wife. Chief cook and bottle washer <laughs> at the Turner House. And so... By about 8 o'clock at night, I wasn't ready to start writing. I was shutting down. So the uh, being able to be retired and kind of have developed more of a routine in the past few months, I write three afternoons a week, and I was shooting for 1,500 words a week. Now I push that out to 3,000 words a week. And it's just flowing more. It's just a little bit easier. I make sure when I end that I either know where I'm going or I've left something a little bit on the cliff so I know exactly where I'm going to start. That helps a lot for, to prevent writer's block for me. I know where I'm going. Okay. And I do have this dry erase board that's got all kinds of notes and ideas on it, too, that kind of gives me a form. But yeah. sometimes my characters do things that I didn't plan on. They, I love hearing that. Yeah, they just, well, wow, I wasn't expecting that, but it just seems 
so appropriate what I just typed. There we are. They just take on a life of their uh, own. Well, they do. <laughs> They're kind of ornery sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> they veer off. <laughs> Has there been any, are you more creative with the writing since you've retired or... No, it's pretty much the same. You pretty much flow the same way. I think it's a different kind of creativity. I think when I first wrote, it was very emotionally challenging for me. It was, I just poured so much into this particular book. And the second one has been a little bit more fun. I know the characters. I know where I'm going with them. Although I did know in the first book, too. But this one's been a little bit more fun. The other was a little bit emotionally challenging for me. Now, Kathy, when you say the second one, you're speaking the sequel. The, the sequel to okay. this. Because I... I well, You've already I, started on the sequel. Oh, yeah. I'm at, they, I've learned that they say about 80,000 to 120,000 words is a, about what they say for a novel. So I'm a, close to 50,000 words for, you, this, for the you're sequel. You're almost there. Well, I'm, I'm getting there. So it's been, it's been fun. And, and I, I, felt kind of cha- I felt kind of maybe a little bit bad about doing word count because I count the words at the end of my workday. And until I read that Mark Twain had little numbers in the side of his writing and they weren't sure what that was and then someone who knows Mark Twain's work very well and has studied it said he was counting words it was a word count and before, I thought before that was even uh, a um, he, he, the thing to do yes he didn't have a word processor to count his words he just he would count them himself oh, wow. so I thought if Mark Twain can write down how much he was writing I guess I can too I'm not that structured at all. <laughs> <laughs> Just let it flow. <laughs> oh, what has been one of your biggest struggles with um, this project? This, my first one took me a long time. It took me about eight years to write because it was so off and on. Okay. I would just let it go for big chunks of time and then get back to it. And, and probably em- it was emotionally draining for me as well. So I think those two things. So it just took a long time for me to do. I have, not, I have to ask this question. How, do you, how did you know then when you were done? Because now you're already on a sequel. How, how did you know when Things Not Seen was finished? Like, okay, that's enough. I'm done with that. I knew, well, I don't want to do a spoiler. But I, okay. I, I, I just, <laughs> I knew where I wanted to end. And I... I did not want all the ends tied up. I wanted the important end t- ends tied up, but not every little thing. Did you know halfway through the book then, or did you know when you started? This is where I'm going to end. I pretty much knew where it was where it was going to end. Interesting. Yeah. Let's go so, to some tips. If you have some tips for um, writers or publishers, or some aspiring writers aspiring or publishers. Aspiring writers. I- I would say I always heard growing up, write. If you want to write, be writing. Mm-hmm. Do do something, whether it's journaling, whatever. And you know, and for me, it was like st- story writing, entering uh-huh. contests. Okay. Um, okay. You know, at school, writing things, being a part of the school newspaper was a huge thing for me. And just, I, I think I've just always been writing. It hasn't always been good, but don't let that stop you. And then, then reading as well. And I, I do read nonfiction. I, I go back and forth, but I've always loved stories. I've always loved stories, and and I when I read stories now, I pay attention to how a writer does it. How do they, how do they move things along, or how do they not move things along, or what do they do that I that I like? Awesome, awesome. So I, I so would, just write. I would That's say write one. and mm-hmm. read, read as well, yes. and just always, and and I I've always been a people watcher. Okay. One one of our funny stories. I'll t- tell you this funny story. Uh-huh. When we lived in New York, my husband and I were on the subway one day, and there was this couple that got on, and they sat across from us, and I watched them. And after a while, she just became incrementally more upset. And I said, "Oh, there, she's really upset." And he goes, "Oh no, she's okay. You know, n- nothing's going on there." And I kept watching. And I thought, "No, she's becoming more and more upset." Well, pretty soon she was in tears, and then the couple got off off the train after a while. And he said, how did you know that? 
And I said, well, I was watching them. I was looking at their facial expressions, their movements, and I've always been a people watcher. Very good. So that's, that's one thing I think that's helped me to become a story writer and a novelist is those little things that you watch that people do. Do you have any writers that you um, look up to or influence you or people who influence you? Um, I just like to read a variety of things. Okay. Uh, just diff- different kind of things, all different kinds of things. Um, I, I would say I, I'm rather eclectic in, okay. in what I read. And m- my husband, I will sing his praises for this. He is my in-house editor, and he's a voracious reader. And so he reads every day as I go along, and I'll say, does this make sense? Did I lose it? Did I lose you anywhere? Does this hang together? And he's he's just a faster, better reader. He's just read so much more than I have. And he'll say, this doesn't make sense to me. You lost me here, or I don't understand what's going on here. So if he says it's good, it's good. And if it's not, it's not. And I pay attention to that. So He's your editor then. He huh? is my, my editor, very yes. Good. <laughs> so I'm very glad to have him. As you're going on this journey, I things pop up, but I'm sure there are some things that perhaps you want to share that we've not even touched on. Well, I've had some fun things to write in my life that we haven't mentioned. Okay. Uh, when we were, and here again, this has to do with people. I mentioned my high school journalism teacher, mm-hmm. and I think one of the fun things that happened to me was in New York. We were we both went to a Christian writers group one time. I went one time and my husband went the second time. And it was just from those two events that there was a woman there named Gwen and she remembered me and I don't know how long later it was not that long that I got a call from her And she worked for an educational PR firm in Manhattan, and she asked if I would be willing to come in and talk with her and her boss about a project. And I thought, well, sure. And so I went in, and they both talked with me, and it was such a funny thing. The thing I remember is they talked to me for about a half an hour, and when they got done talking to me, they said, well, do you understand what we're asking of you? And I said, let me see if I get it. So I fed it back. And the gentleman named Boris, he said to me, you have just said in 25 words or less what we've been trying to explain to you for the last 30 <laughs> minutes. It was, just, it was just a funny moment. <laughs> but what they were asking is their client was Procter & Gamble. And they wanted me to come up with a storyline about soap so that they could make educational PR materials around it for schools and for young children about the importance of washing their hands. So, so from from you involved in a writers group? Yes. How cool is that? Yes. And so not only did I do that, but then later on they came back to me and I did a similar thing for them about brushing teeth, same same um, client. And so I did that. And then another year, another time I worked for them on a uh, educational materials for older children, high school, uh, for Weight Watchers. So it was through this educational PR firm that I got to do this, this really neat project. Well, the first time I went and I left the building and told them I'd be glad to do it, I walked out and I thought, this is like a movie. <laughs> I, I need the music to come up around me just like in a movie because that's what I felt like. How did this happen? Right. You know, it was such a cool moment. So there again, it was meeting somebody who pulled me into something that okay. I would have never gone into Are otherwise. you writing your memoirs? No, just just chatting with you here. Yeah, you should be. <laughs> and then somehow uh, we met in a very unusual way. You and your husband, my husband okay. and I. And so, so we had we got married in 1983, and then a few years later, I ended up writing a story which was called "The Mailbox Lover," and it appeared in Guidepost Magazine. Because we, we met through a correspondence organization called Single Book Lovers. This is before all the internet and everything. So I wrote the story of, <laughs> of our courtship and how we met. And there again, it was writing because we have about 600 letters that we sent back and forth 
to each other during that time because oh. it was before email and texting and all of that. And what are you going to do with those letters? Because I'm sure you still have They're them. They're in a box at home, uh-huh. yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> some more writing. Yes, yeah, some more writing. More writing, yes. Oh, how Kathy, I hate to end this interview. I'm going to um, give you the last thought. The last thought. Yes, ma'am. You know, it's been fun. I I am so grateful <laughs> that God has given me the gift to write. And you you write in solitude, which is is difficult. I think that's one of the most difficult things about writing is making making myself go down there every day and write and invent people and situations, things like that. But you never know who you're going to impact. In my journey of writing, there are times I've gotten calls or, or uh, an occasional note from someone who's been touched by my writing, mm-hmm. and that is such a blessing to be able to use the gift God gave me to encourage someone, to share something that makes all the difference in their life, or to to let them know that it's okay to doubt yes. and to question and to look for God even when things are difficult and to be honest. So I'm grateful for this gift that I've been given, and he is still letting me use it for him, and I'm thankful. Thank you so much. You are listening to Speak Now. 